So let's begin. First of all, thanks a lot for being here. It's such a great opportunity to discuss your work of art after having experienced it. I was really mesmerized by the Gaia hypothesis and I would like to see it again also, <laughs> you know. But to start off, uh, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, an introduction and how you've been working in the art field as an actress, performer, singer, and so many other things. So as an introduction, what would you say about yourself? Um, yeah, well, um, yeah, so I'm uh, Linda Gimans. Uh, I have been, I'm trained as a theater performance maker and I also studied music theater. Um, and I'm working as a uh, theater maker, performer, actress uh, for quite a while now. Um, I uh, am part of a theater collective uh, where we create mostly documentary theater pieces um, and I also create uh, my own solo performances. Um, and those performances uh, are music theater performances where I mostly focus on um, uh, transforming into non-human characters. Um, there is a word for that that I've uh, <laughs> learned from you. Um, uh, yeah, so that's uh, a thing that I do a lot and I am also working as a teacher uh, uh, in the uh, Artes uh, Academy for Music Theater um, and I also work as a coach for other theater makers, performers. Um, yeah. Oh, that's great. So, you mentioned a new word that you've learned, which is uh, prosopopeia, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is like a figure of language to refer to the impersonation of uh, non-human entities or animals or even like objects, if you pretend to be them. And in the Gaia hypothesis, uh, you impersonate uh, a fish, a spacecraft, a human cell, yeah. <laughs> and of course a human dancer. <laughs> and so was it your intention really to, to give a voice and an expression to these creatures, these objects that are voiceless, that are devoid of language? Is this one of the, the core uh, uh, intentions of this artwork? Yeah, I think so. Well, it, I mean, it started for me um, when I was, well, sort of, yeah, I was, I was sort of going in a downward spiral in my climate depression and I didn't know how to think about the future anymore. <laughs> uh, and then I um, came across, uh, well, quite similarly, like the work of Don Haraway and I came across the concept of the Gaia hypothesis and these both things they sort of proposed to me new ways of thinking and of feeling connected and um, because I, I and then it was just a fascination and, and, and it took me a while to understand why it gave me this um, sort of feeling of connection again. Um, and it was just um, about, well, you know, sometimes I can, I can just feel lonely and hopeless and to feel part of this bigger structure um, and to see how we all have a place or something in this world without in any way um, um, not acknowledging uh, the responsibility we have and the, um, well, the state that the planet is in right now. In some ways, there was like a perspective or, or hope in it for me, um, and then I I came to think of how to um, um, trans how to bring that across to an audience, and I feel like uh, if I use my uh, a craft, which is basically as an actor um, embodying, I, I well that maybe is my way of um, um, suggesting uh, a form of um, uh, or like uh, seducing the audience to uh, to make a connection to not only other humans but to the other creatures and the other things that we share 
uh, our planet with and that we need to honor and that we need to acknowledge as at least equal to ourselves and um, yeah so so it, it came um, yeah, it became clear quite soon that I was going to want to do that. And then I have been thinking quite a while about also, can I do that? Is it like morally okay to, um, you know, to, to suggest that I would ever know what a fish would want or think? Um, and then I thought, well, if I try to do it in a very responsible way and also always making very clear that it is a thought experiment and that it's about just trying to do it while also acknowledging that we can of course never ever uh, experience what the other creature is experiencing um, then I thought yeah I think this is my way and so this is like the, the, the conceptual um, path towards it but there is also like the playful part that I just, well, as an actor, I love playing a fish. I love, you know, giving myself the artistic problem of like, how, how on earth are you going to play a fish? And like, what costume do I need to play a fish? Um, uh, and, and I think also like, it, it also, it really brings together also the importance of doing it and also the importance of play because we need to, play and to um, move beyond our rational, uh, um, beyond the capacities of what we can reach rationally uh, to find this new form of knowledge or this other form of connection. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something very interesting for me, uh, which is how we deal nowadays with anxieties or fears or depressions concerning what's going on in the planet and the biodiversity crisis and through art through expression perhaps we can learn some empathy like in your t-shirt you have the word empathy <laughs> but usually we think of empathy as something between humans mm. and I think that the Gaia hypothesis opens up an horizon for us to feel empathy in an expanded uh, sense. So, how do you feel personally dealing with this eco anxiety and these fears about the future of the planet yeah. uh, through art and through some sort of ethics of empathy? Yeah, I think. Uh, well, I think maybe talking about a solution is like not solution is, is, is not like possible or that's not the way to go, but moving forward or dealing um, through empathy, I think is I think um, the way of getting out of like just depression and just feeling paralyzed. Uh, or, or feeling like you, you cannot do anything um, is is also appreciation. So I think through empathy, through empathy, I, I I'm able to truly admire and appreciate everything that is still there, and that also makes me really want to uh, take care of everything that is still there, and makes me want to try to find a way. Uh, that does justice to everything there is and I don't know how but that makes me want to do it because I appreciate it so much and because I honor it I guess mm -hmm. yes and what's also very interesting for me is that on stage you are alone you are the only performer the only actress the only singer and I went to the theater, I was imagining uh, some sort of monologue and sometimes inside the field of art, sometimes monologues get very egocentric, narcissistic, very self-centered and this play is very surprising, you know, because even though you're alone on stage, 
you embody a multiplicity of beings of, of characters and there is a, a like a polyphony in the in the play yeah. you know even though you're alone yeah so that's very interesting i think this is, is very original so yeah. how do you manage to be on stage a multiplicity of beings yeah well we that's actually something we i'm happy that 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 came across to you because i wanted to i wanted it to be about this multiplicity um but i at first it was a big artistic problem because i also wanted it to be about the fact that you know all these things are there at the same time so in a way it's about also sort of horizontality or um this this n seeing uh, experiencing being in the world as this um networky thing which is you know all at the same time but then if you make a work in theater that's a work that exists in time so i cannot do just me i cannot tell a story like i cannot speak five words at the same time so i'm gonna have to put it in time i'm gonna have to use linear time to tell a story about vertical horizontality you know about everything um so in a way it felt like uh, a sacrifice to the concept that i was going to use a linear uh sort of journey through this universe but in a way it was also the answer um, to making it accessible to an audience so to, to put these things in a very um, uh, um, uh, carefully um, built up uh, step by step journey through this thing that is everywhere all the time mm -hmm. I think that's what we, for us, decided that's the way we're going to try to, me and the team that I've been working it on, working on it with, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how, how we decided to do it. Wow, that's super interesting. And I, I, I've also been thinking about the horizontal and the vertical, uh, about the play, yeah. but in a different sense than the one that you <laughs> mentioned, because I was thinking that you have a, a stage of course, it's kind of an horizontal stage, mm -hmm. but inside the narrative, uh, you take us both uh, to the depths of like the ocean floor. Like there's this character of this fish, which is really from the depths, and you make us imagine some sort of diving down to this yeah. dimension, the verticality going down. But then, in the succession that you mentioned in time, you incorporate the space shuttle, and we go upwards to the, the, the layers of the sky that only a rocket can, can get to. And all that is done while you stay in space, in yeah. the, <laughs> the horizontality of the stage, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I also left uh, when I saw it in Den Haag. I left the theater thinking, "Wow, I took a cosmic trip, <laughs> upwards and downwards, and yet the artist didn't leave that <laughs> no. confinement in space." Yeah. You know. Uh, so how would you uh, react to, to, to that idea also of uh, incorporating an upwards and downwards journey in the play? Yeah, I, 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 quite in an early stage, I, I had the idea of, um, yeah, first like first moving down, then moving up, and then moving inwards. That were like the three directions that I wanted to travel in. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's also that's also the beauty and the power of of theater that you can. Um, Yeah, you you can you can move to a place without you know physically moving to a place, and I I try to make it in a way also a bodily experience, um, or a sort of an invitation to have a bodily experience 
while staying with your physical body in your seat. That's also something that I'm saying in the beginning of your play, like your body stays in your seat, but we are going to travel. Um, so yeah, I mean, in a way, it's also, it's also a, a guided meditation, um, partly. But then I wanted to add also the part where it does become theatrical and about also making images and, and, and truly embodying yeah, characters that's, in mm -hmm. these worlds that we're traveling to. Yeah, it's very interesting you said that there's an axis going upwards, the space shuttle, an axis going downwards, which is the fish of the deep ocean, yeah. an axis going inwards, and then you become a cell. Yeah. <laughs> so that's very imaginative also, you know, I would like to hear more about that. How do you become something that is so tiny and which doesn't have a consciousness perhaps, but it works inside an organic uh, whole, you know? Mm. The, the cell part of the play is so fascinating, you know? But it's, perhaps it's, is it more challenging to be a cell than to be a fish? Mm. Well, I don't know actually, because... Hmm. I, I, maybe, maybe it became, it was more, the character that, that it, that developed for the cell is, was more about some kind of innocence and pureness, mm -hmm. um, because it is like the starting point of life, which is not shaped by, well, this is, it's all like, of course, uh, projection and imagination, but it, uh, because it's not shaped by experiences or anything um, and it's only drive is existing and growing maybe um, but I, it was not really a str struggle in that sense it was just using using uh, our or like uh, my fantasy and, and, and creativeness in another way I guess um, and also because while well, in, in the play also the cell um, sort of reveals itself to be an egg cell and also like my egg cell and that was something that I had a lot of uh, thoughts about and in a way it was also really healing to um, by embodying my own egg cell being able to sort of have a conversation with this cell and ask this cell also my personal questions about um, about what I would need, or maybe anyone in general would need, to feel like you are part of a family in this world. Do you need to make a family out of your own blood to have a family? Um, and I think it was really, it was really, yeah. I mean, you know, in a, I mean, yeah. It was it it was healing or, or or really nice to be able to play with these thoughts in 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 this way. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I like doing that, or, yeah. And do you think that the cell part of the play connects with the very beginning also, where you address the audience, and it felt to me like some confession or some autobiographical grounding? Is that the way to read it? Like you start off the play, I'm a woman, I have 37 years old, I don't have kids. And yeah. I'm, so do you correlate also this autobiographical part of the play yeah. with playing with your ex cell? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, yeah, there is definitely, um, that is definitely a part where um, this this whole trip that I'm taking or this uh, thought experiment that I'm doing um, touches some very personal questions that I have. So I, yeah, that and 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 uh, also is is not like the full. I you know I didn't want it to be about that like only or that being the main point, but I did want to. Um, make that connection 
with these personal questions because I think th these are there for me and they are, these are also a part of mm -hmm. of why I may be so fascinated about thinking like this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned also the guided meditation. I think it's a, it's a very interesting expression because sometimes you say to the audience, please close your eyes and uh, imagine. So you, you request the audience to imagine and you are in a position of guiding this meditation. But also the play is very dynamic, you know, there's, I would say, action, not in a Hollywood sense, but lots of things happen yeah. in, in one hour. And that's interesting also because there are people who say that meditation is not exactly about being um, still, that it's possible for you to do meditation in movement. Like the, there are some codes, the, the whirling dervishes of the Sufis and mm. stuff that they feel like I'm going to meditate through dancing. I'm going to meditate through walking. So how do you feel about this meditation that you propose, but inside a work of art that is very dynamic? Yeah. So I, I got into a, a state of meditation, I felt. I was still in in, yeah. in the seat, but I, I was dynamically meditating about the cosmos and that network of beings. So I think there's a conception of meditation that you deal yeah. with that's yeah. very original. Well, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, I think, well, I think in general, Acting, being on stage, performing on stage, is um, for me like a meditative act because it's about very much about focus. It's very much about being very open to what you're experiencing um, and sort of investigating what you're experiencing while you're experiencing it and also experiencing it in your body. Um, so maybe in a way I am <laughs> I am always meditating when I am acting you know um, and so that's one thing and then on the other hand I like the form of a guided meditation in this performance I use quite literally in some moments and then in the other moments I sort of lure the audience out of this meditation maybe and sort of make it more about them watching a play but still i wanted to so i'm i'm it's interesting that you say you were staying in this meditative state and i think it's also working that way because there is this i mean the play is dynamic but i also we try to keep it in some way calm or, or um, have it keep that same focus that really allows you to join me on every step. So, yeah, I guess it's a, in that way a meditative play mm -hmm. or a meditative piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's the whole thing, that's also something that I'm saying in the beginning, I, I see the whole thing as an invitation. Um, so if you accept the invitation, then you are on this journey, which is a, yeah, maybe a meditative journey, a meditation on, on the universe. <laughs> yeah. But so you think that we can meditate in movements. There's no ne necessary stillness no. and stiffness to meditation because I, I, I sometimes think that I, I get a little bit of revulsion from certain guided meditations that they kind of say to you, you have to be still, your mind has to be a blank and you have to be... Mm -hmm. No, cool. I, yeah, I think, I mean, maybe, maybe, well, I mean, there is a... 
I'm not an expert on meditation in that sense, but maybe, I mean, maybe uh, for me it, it's about also when I'm on stage and when I'm in the right um, focus, it's it is about a certain clarity and it's about not um, being in these meta thoughts about yourself and where you are and 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 having this um, commentary on yourself. You know, it's about losing that. It's about losing being above yourself and being sort of being able to be in <laughs> in yourself and because of that reason being able to also be fully open uh, and I, I, I think um, yeah it's not at all maybe even easier to move I'm also when I'm always when I'm in uh, like a yoga class or something and there is a meditation I'm always like <laughs> <laughs> for some reason it's easier for me that way mm-hmm to move through the meditation, yeah. right? Yeah, that's great. And I would like to choose uh, to talk about uh, music a little bit, because you do like musical theater. You also mentioned that you act uh, uh, in education with music theater. And this play, you've worked uh, in collaboration with Rod Van Oosten. Yeah, Rod Van Oosten, yes. Yes, and, and, and the play has uh, its original songs and so talk a little bit about that the process of creating the songs and performing and singing them uh, also in a state of a certain aloneness mm. because you don't have a, a band no. you don't have other musicians with you uh, but yet I, I felt the songs were very warm and you, you don't feel like uh, the aloneness of the singer-songwriter alone on stage. You manage somehow to make the music resound with some sort of uh, this collectivity of beings, you know? So how was that process of uh, making the songs and preparing to sing them? And you also play a little bit of uh, keyboards, right? Well, so yeah, I... I um I had been working with Roald for a previous piece. We made a piece about a sex robot together, so that was also about me uh, embodying some non-human uh, uh, character. Um, and yeah, I mean, so I think he's a great musician and I was really happy that we could work together and, and, and create songs. And I think working on this it went on sort of two separate levels, so sometimes we were already just uh, jamming together and we had some sketches of, of music and then at a certain point I came up with the concept of Gaia Hypothesis and these three worlds, like the deep sea, the uh, space and the inside of the human body that I wanted to also uh, um, um, translate into sound. Um, and then we started working on that and also intuitively also writing already some songs and then the characters became clear and then the songs uh, related to the characters um, and well so these things you know uh, corresponded with each other um, and we sort of or I, yeah I wanted it to be something that was just me on stage because it is about being alone, but still being together with everything at the same time. And I do think, I don't feel alone on stage because the music is so helpful to me and it, it really also guides me through the piece um, and, and, and helps me create these worlds and um, really also, I think is super important also for uh, the audience to immerse it makes it much easier and much more also seductive to sort of... I want it to be, to be seductive in a way and I think also the music is really... Or it has a seductive um, element to it. Um, so yeah, that, that's how... And, and, and I think the, this style of, of synth pop is something that Rolt and I had been doing before and just felt like a vocabulary, vocabulary we, want, we wanted to use um, and also works well with also incorporating these just elements of pop culture and elements of drag and 
also making it, yeah, making it also fun and seductive and entertaining, whilst also incorporating all these philosophical questions and 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 talking about maybe more hard things. It, it, it's a, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a way. I don't know. Yeah. And do you have the plan to release the songs and to have some sort of a career as a singer-songwriter parallel to your career as an actress and performer? I mean, I mean we are definitely going to keep working together and we are working on uh, uh, also Spotify release of the music for this. So maybe we're all, all, we also want to try to perform the songs live, so with Roald also playing. Uh, which will be a very interesting experiment, being more of a band setting. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think in the end my my talent is in the combination with also theatre. So I don't know, although I would love to be the singer of a rock band, I don't, <laughs> I, I don't, it's not like my main career goal right now mm -hmm. uh, but I love to play with music and I love to be inspired by great musicians uh, like Roald and I think for a future because I, I, I will definitely be working in music theater and for a new piece that I'm working on it's probably going to be a very different style musically um, and, and, and I'm, I'm also yeah I, I think I think music theater especially is very um is a very great field to explore also these um speculative uh worlds in because it is in itself uh already multi-dimensional because it's music and theater it's it is always already a, a collaboration or a, 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 a like um multidisciplinary uh uh, experience so it's already this world where things collide and where new visions or new worlds form so that's why I think it's super uh, uh, because uh, that's why I like being in that field mm -hmm. already uh, and th that's why it's the, the right place to explore new worlds I think yes when I've watched the guy hypothesis I was afterwards thinking that it would make such a great uh, visual album or something yeah. like that yeah. because we have a tendency right now in pop music of artists that do uh, films to illustrate the, the albums they release. Uh, I've watched some that I, I think is really extraordinary like Janelle Monet, she yeah. did the Dirty Computer uh, Beyoncé, she did the Black Skin and mm. TV on the radio did also. Yeah. So it's a very interesting in intermingled yeah. art form yeah. that I think it's quite promising. Should should think perhaps. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, we we so we we there is a, a a filmmaker that we have been working also for the sex robot piece. Uh, Tanya Buskin is her name and. We also made some videos from this piece, also, also like uh, promotion videos and everything from it. And I do think it is uh, visually strong, also, and, and yeah, it would, it would be maybe suitable for that. Yeah, it's very, very visually stunning. Yeah. And at the end of the play, uh, after we go gone downwards to the ocean floor, we go upwards to the sky, we go inwards to the cell. There is a dance performance. Yeah. For me, it was kind of surprising. It's like a wild Dionysian dance that erupts on stage, and it it, it gets the the audience uh, really in another mood. Mm -hmm. It seems we leave that guided meditation, yeah. and we get inside some Dionysian theater, especially because. If I understood well, the character says, uh, I'm probably gonna die tonight. <laughs> this is like the end of the word party. And so how did that come about? I, 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 I felt very impressed by the scene. I was surprised by that. But I also think it correlates to music theater as you think it. I, I think for me, this song was about it is a bit, uh, people interpret it in, in different ways, I, I, I have noticed. 
Um, but for, for me it was about like if you like the ultimate conclusion of um, an extreme connection, if I try to truly connect, you know, in every direction to this universe, this world that I'm a part of, I sort of feel myself disappearing in the end. So the ultimate form of extreme connection is disappearance and like losing the ego and like disappearing yourself. Uh, and in that sense, it relates to dying. Um, so it's not about sort of killing yourself in the sense of like suicide or anything. I mean, to me, I mean, you, but you know, it's, a, it's about this feeling of being, uh, disappearing out of yourself, actually. And in that sense, dying. And I, I feel that that relates to also the feeling that you can have on a rave or when you're like in this concert and you're like ecstatically feeling part of such a group that you're also sort of losing your ego. Um, and then I was at a party like that and a friend said to me like, oh, I'm gonna die tonight. And then I was like, well, this, 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 is a, this should be a song and this is a feeling that I, um, that relates to uh, what, I'm, what I'm researching in an artistic way. Um, so that actually feel that, so that's for me is about like yeah it is a bit of a di different chapter it's also a choice of just wanting to end, end the show with a bang <laughs> or something but it's also about the ultimate con um, uh, uh, I'm searching for the word uh, like the, the ultimate consequence, yeah, of, of 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 really trying to expand your consciousness in all these ways is about losing your consciousness in a way, or is it is about losing yourself? And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. It's like the death of the ego yeah. that separates you from this network of of yeah. being. So this song has a very liberating effect. I felt also that this I'm gonna die tonight was not anything like uh, suicidal or depressive. No. It was more like uh, what Nietzsche describes of the Dionysian theater, the, the, the festivals mm. where theater was born, mm. where you, you had the, the people who followed the, the god Dionysus they wanted some sort of ecstasy yeah. in community yeah. and they did that through wine, through dancing, through music yeah. but they wanted to get beyond individuality like the death of the ego and yeah. theater was also some sort of ancient yeah. technology to reach this collective ecstasy or yeah, something like that yeah and i think it's so so interesting that uh, you know that is a way of uh reaching some kind of transcendence or you know uh, being able to um get out of yourself or get out of your your ego and and you can everyone so many people are searching for that in in different ways so you can you know, meditate, sit still and try to reach that level. You can uh, be on a rave for 27 hours and also trying to reach that same experience of, of, of transcendence or of ecstasy maybe. Uh, and you can go to the theater and you can... or, or like, yeah, or in, uh, immerse yourself in other forms of art. It's... it's there is many w roads to ecstasy or to transcendence or yeah mm -hmm. and i have a quote here that i think it's very interesting i would like to see how you react to that <laughs> it's from the dvd dances of ecstasy oh. and there is a, a a practitioner of fire dance uh, and she says uh, that by coming together dancing and drumming and connecting with the earth and each other we are healing some very profound disconnection. So mm. I thought this was a very interesting yeah. phrase Beautiful. because it, it makes a, some sort of a diagnosis of a newness 
we are suffering from this connection and through the rhythm, the music, the dancing, you heal with this connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can reconnect to something very old, probably, or uh, uh, so, yeah, I, th I think. It is, yeah, I think it is, it is very true and it also, it's also about experiencing this togetherness um, which can happen in, in this kind of movements together um, and I think which can also happen in your seat in, 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 in a theatre when you, it's about also experiencing togetherness um, and the idea that you are with so many people it also happens, I mean I was singing in a choir for a while that also, also speaks to something really old to me when we are with all these people uh, not doing like the part that we feel is most important but just being doing this little part to make together this sound that we are collectively trying to Reach it also. I, I felt the same um, reconnection to something that I really wanted to connect to. I, I I had the need to connect to that or to experience that networky feeling again. Or yeah. And also, a thing that I would like to discuss a little bit: uh, the Gaia hypothesis comes from scientists. James Lovelock, Lee Margulies, and it's an interesting phenomenon also when art and science, they intermingle, so you bring this concept, uh, which also comes from Greek myth, the, the, the goddess yeah. Gaia, the, the whole of the earth as a, a living organism, so to talk a little bit about that uh, relationship with science, uh, through art, mm -hmm. you know, how these two fields can come together, can intermingle, how important that is in, uh, for, for the future of, of the species, you know, because sometimes you read some books written by scientists and it's not good reading, you know, you, you, you almost get the feeling that the scientists should read more novels and poets mm -hmm for them yeah. to express yeah. themselves, for the, those are important ideas yeah. to reach the people in, in their, their yeah. hearts and yeah. minds. I, I think there is a... Um, um, yeah, I think there is a, 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 a need for, for artists to step in where, uh, at this point where uh, science and maybe scientists uh, can no longer uh, go or or because maybe they don't have the scientific facts yet uh, or because it's not according to the rules of science um, and that's that's a great that area where that and that's a great playing field for uh, for artists um, and not only a great playing field but also an important um, uh, question that we maybe you know are called to answer to because um, it is also where maybe uh, someone else that doesn't read science can s step in and uh, and and um, like I like for it the piece that I did I work really hard also on with the whole team we all work really hard on making it um, um, yeah also easy or, or seductive um, and then to lure you into embracing these thoughts and philosophies that other people work really hard on uh, and, and make them accessible also in, in a way. Um, so yeah, I, I think... Um, and, and, and also about... Um, yeah, so what, 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 what it, 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 For me, it's really fascinating to think how science and myth, they all, all, always intermingle. Yeah. Because when you read science nowadays, they are thinking about Gaia, 
Prometheus. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, th there's no divide between no. science and art. You can't keep them apart. No. It's a, it's a false idea to think you know, science is in this field and yeah. art is in this field. Yeah. Because the scientists, they name their theories uh, yeah. uh, with the Greek myth. And usually from the yeah. poets, you yeah. know. But I think also because that I think that happens also because I mean I was because we we have always we are always looking for ways to and I think art, mythology, uh, astrology, it's all ways of 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 humanity to try to uh, give shape or express. Um, forms of knowledge that we cannot yet comprehend rationally or scientifically or um, so there is all these concepts or intuitive feelings or symbolizations uh, mythological concepts whatever that later on maybe are being sort of partially uh, described by science as well um, so, but but still, we always feel the limits of 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 rational knowledge, or Western knowledge, uh, uh, very much, of course, uh, mm -hmm. the Western concept of knowledge uh, that a lot of mythology, art, uh, um, oral history, all these things have already um, body memory. Mm -hmm. They already exist. And do you feel perhaps that Gaia as a myth? correlates with uh, feminism in a sense because of course it's a goddess and not a god uh, and of course it's been suggested by Lovelock and by Lee Margulies you know and I have a, a feeling or a guess you know that the, the world view based on, on, on Gaia it, it's uh, it's way better for the development of uh, uh, our relationships with each other than this patriarchal God that it's mm. imposed upon us by yeah. Christianity and yeah. Judaism and Islam. So I, I think it's very interesting also how a, a goddess, a Gaia, yeah. is brought forth by science, but it's a science that's telling us to change our ways because we are damaging yeah. the equilibrium of this mother, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, at first when I started reading about the Gaia hypothesis, I was also reading this piece by Latour about everything that Gaia is not, of course, and then how in a way you are you know, if, if you say Gaia is a mother, then you are already like putting something on top of this thing that we are in. Um, but I do like the concept of, of um, like a female power or the, the, the proposal to uh, think about more it from a female wisdom. Well, I mean, I think in, in general, I've recently been talking also about a lot of, uh, through, uh, with a lot of animal activists and a lot of them are female and I think in general um, being open to um, uh, uh, empathy with other creatures is maybe a feminist act because we all know what it's like to be objectified, to be not be taken seriously so maybe we we are we are open to the fact that the main stream is not the right stream <laughs> in general uh, and that maybe that is a, like a, a I don't know a feminist view um, mm -hmm. yeah and, 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 and of course the yeah the Christian God relates maybe to the Western patriarchic idea of authority and 
top-down guidance instead of being part of a network. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I like that critique of the, the top-down authoritarian uh, uh, yeah. God, you know. And I also read Latour, and I think there's an interesting idea that he puts forward also about a war of the worlds. It's an expression he uses, which is not the one that in science fiction A.J. Wells described between humans and aliens, but he's talking about a, a, a new war mm -hmm. that we're going through, and he opposes. On one side, we have the modern humans, and on the other side, you have uh, Gaia's uh, demos. He, he calls it something like that. You have the, the, the beings that uh, compose Gaia, all the, the biodiversity, all the plants, the insects, the animals, and there is a war of, of the Gaians against the modern humans who created industrial capitalism, extractivism and mm -hmm. fossil fuel burnings. And of course, when I read this, I, I thought, well, it's an interesting idea, but it's a duality. Yeah. And it's all, it borders on some sort of manichaistic thinking. Yeah. We should follow this because yeah. these are screwing yeah. up, you know. Yeah. But I think your play correlates a little bit with the, what Latour is, is trying to think about, but in a poetic sense yeah. and without preaching the way, you know, yeah, you yeah. should go this way, this yeah. path is the one. I mean, well, I, I haven't read this uh, piece that you are talking about right now, but... Um, and I, yeah, I also don't know about like a uh, good guy, bad guy, situation but I mean I, I, I did really like when I when I was um, embodying this fish character and thinking about the world where the fish lives and then at the same time um, being this uh, um, space shuttle and, and being in her world I, I do like that they were both seeing millionaires, like rich men, penetrating their worlds and trying to reach it. Like, there is these millionaires that, that, that like, um, build crazy machines to go as deep into the ocean as possible. And, it, I mean, me as a fish was just looking at it and thinking, why? What, I mean, what are you looking for down here? Why do you want to come here? And, and at the same time, there was, of course, this battle going on between Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, who can, you know, who can go into space with this phallic shaped object. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I thought there, I mean, if you talk, I mean, there was a bit of, um, tongue in cheek uh, uh, <laughs> criticism to, <laughs> to those <laughs> creatures in there, uh, of course, yeah. And it's a very funny moment in the play when, when you're inside an audience and you can feel the laughter of, the, yeah. of the, the people. And when you do this satire about the billionaires in space, it's, yeah. it's very funny. But you also deal with something very serious, which is like uh, trash orbiting our planet. And, yeah. and, and, but I remember very well that the people were really laughing aloud in this in this monologue of the space shuttle, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's really fun because I... Especially when there was a lot of young people in the audience, they really also, they really got the, the not just about uh, Jeff and Elon and everything, and sometimes when there was a few times when there was only old people in the audience, they were like, mm -hmm, I don't know. <laughs> so that was really... Um, yeah, no, but it, I mean, it is... About, I, I, when, I, when I thought about this character that is in space, which is like a space shuttle that is not in use anymore, it made me think of like all this, all this garbage that is floating in space. And I was also just questioning, is this part of Gaia as, I mean, 
is it part of Gaia? Does it belong? And and, and yeah, just just um, I, I, I don't know. I'm confused about that, but I, I'm also sad about all this. I mean, all this yeah, all this trash that that is yes. that is there. I also don't know if a space shuttle or or some sort of machinery like computers and data centers does that apply to the concept of Gaia? You know, the the, I mean, the yeah. man-made Anthropocene world it has transformed Gaia, and now Gaia is dead. Also, you know. So. I mean, it is a. I, I mean, it is a form of intelligence now that we are sharing uh, our our planet with. So. I, I do think we need to sort of empathize with that intelligence as well. Uh, yeah, I think so. It, it's, yeah. And your t-shirt is very interesting, intergalactic empathy. It's the first time I heard that expression. I, I put it on uh, for today. I thought it was, uh, it matched. <laughs> That's empathy in a very broad sense, you know? Yeah. Because the play got me thinking about interspecies empathy, yeah. of course, but uh, I think intergalactic empathy gets in, in, into the science fiction realm. And are, are you a science fiction reader? Do you like it? Or? I mean, I will not claim to know to be an expert at all, but I do like it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I really like it. I can appreciate. Uh, a good science fiction and it's uh, yeah I think also it's um, thinking about certain problems it's the only uh, fiction or not even fiction it's, it's the only way of thinking that still makes sense because uh, <laughs> we are reaching the limits of, of uh, what we can think of uh, when we are not in the sci-fi realm like yeah we need to come up with concepts worlds um, uh, proposals that are not that are based on something else than what we are working with right now so that's why I think we I mean it's it is fun, but it is also essential. Yeah. As a, some sort of tool of speculation about the future also, do you think? Because I think many science fiction, uh, of course, it has an entertainment aspect. It's quite funny if you, if you read the great novels about space travel or something. Mm -hmm. But actually, when you go deep into the, the works of art, they make you uh, speculate profoundly about the paths that mankind is taking yeah. and also sometimes the, the, the sci-fi when it's dystopian it scares you and it kind of uh, puts an alarm call in your head and says well beware of this road because it can lead to a very bad place and uh, so I'm also uh, writing about that how a work of science fiction can frighten you, mm. you can fear a fictional scenario and then you can uh, somehow change your action in the present yeah. in order not to take this path that was described by the artist yeah. and shift to another yeah. route, you yeah. know. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, I, I, I think that is a very valid point. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that, you know, in a, in a positive sense, it can um, suggest to you all the knowledge that we don't have yet, but that might be there. Like, for example, I, I read this amazing, I think it's quite a well-known piece. It's about, um, who was the writer, great female author? Um, it's about a, a, a language of ants and dolphin language. You know the piece? Um, uh, oh, I, sh I should look it up. Is it a book, an article? It is a, it is a book. It is a small... Um, 
I think it's it's by Legin, Ursula Ursula. Ursula Legin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's 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 like these it's like um, a, f- a fictional um, a magazine, um, a fictional scientific magazine about um, animal and plant languages, and it's about different scientists um, uh, writing about their work and also criticizing each other's work um, and so it's there is this discussion in how to interpret different dialects in uh, penguin language for example um, and to me that was like of course in 2050 I don't know years we will be having these discussions um, and this is to show that, of course, there is this depth in animal languages as well that maybe we cannot reach yet. And I think right now that I'm thinking about it, because I am working on a piece about chicken language right now, and I think maybe that reading that novel also planted the seed for <laughs> for for that. So I think also in it. Yeah, you, you said like uh, how, how science fiction can sort of be a warning or like suggest a, a, like a scenario you know, that you don't want to go to. It also can um, suggest and also seduce you into um, being open to uh, the richness of other knowledges and, and this appreciation that we talked about and the, um, yeah suggestion of, of forms of knowledge that we don't have yet uh, rationally but we know that they're there mm-hmm. yes excellent i actually have a, a few questions that i think that correlate okay. to that <laughs> but i think perhaps it's the last section uh, i'll actually quote myself in that article that i wrote after watching the gaia hypothesis uh, I said that we are urgently in need of going beyond anthropocentric perspectives and that the Gaia hypothesis was like a work of art that was seducing the audience to think beyond the, the human and this, this perspective that we have that it's perhaps at the root of the climate crisis because we relate everything to the human when we should relate to the, mm. the biggest uh, of, of, of the holes that we are inside, you know. Uh, and it seems that your, your ethics as an artist is the one of making kin with other beings and trying to understand other consciousness, other kinds of minds, you know. And this is very interesting because in human sciences we have lots of authors writing about that, Mm -hmm. like Donna Haraway and anthropologists also in Brazil, like Viveiro de Castro. And would you agree with that uh, uh, idea that this uh, play, The Gaia Hypothesis, uh, gives like a contribution for us to go beyond the anthropocentric perspective, so it seduces you to to become in a playful way uh, something other than human. Yeah, I mean, I think that I mean that is what the world needs right now. I mean, like we need, and I I also think more and more people are sort of becoming aware of us humans being in need to do that but um, we are looking for ways we are all looking for ways how to do this so and not only artists but there is but a lot of artists are also working on um, yeah ways of 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 giving voice to uh, to the more than human and also from 
this I think that's also where like fascination and urgency come together. Like you feel that we are being we want to move there because we we need to move there. Um, yeah. So. I, uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think that that's that is um, a very very urgent um, question, and and also um, we need many many more um, um, uh, how do you say it like proposals for that and many more um, attempts also because it's just attempts because we can never we are human we are we are. Uh, confined or like we are doomed to be human but mm -hmm. we can do attempts to be better at not only being human but or being like a responsible human or being an empath empathetic empathetic what's the word yeah. empathetic empathetic human yes, yeah. um, and um, empathetic and, not and, only and, towards and, and, and humans and multi-species empathy of course yeah yeah multi-species empathy yeah, that's great. I think interspecies empathy defines quite well the, the, the play, you know. Yeah. And also when I, 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 I saw it, I've written about it, and then I came back to the article, and uh, I'm not really satisfied with it. <laughs> After our talk to, today, I think it can be really enriched. Mm. And one concept that I think perhaps it's appropriate is shamanism mm. uh, because i was reading this interesting book by uh, nicolas borio he's a french uh, mm. philosopher of art aesthetics of the capital scene and he talks a lot about some artists that act a little bit like the figure of the shaman mm. in traditional societies in indigenous mm. uh, tribes because the, the shaman, he is a little bit a, a, a guide to another sort of consciousness. Yeah. And he's also like the medicine man. Mm. If you have a community that is suffering from some, some trauma or is suffering from an illness of a disconnection, alienation, the shaman is the, the healer, but also to heal he usually takes some plants that gets him into a psychoactive journey and he can become other than human. Mm -hmm. So he becomes the tiger, he becomes the panther, he becomes the ego. So he, he goes mm -hmm. into a dream stage and the messages from his journey will heal his community. Mm -hmm. And, and I was uh, thinking a little bit about that experience of watching the Gaia Hypothesis mm -hmm. and how you have acted a little bit like in a shamanic vibe. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that is intentional, but Nicolas Borio writes about so many artists that are acting shamanically mm -hmm. and that perhaps you have acted unintentionally like a shaman or a shaw woman or, or something like that H have you given it any any thought is this concept is something that you, you you're familiar with well i mean i think sort of um, putting myself on the same level as a shaman would would feel um, not right. Uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable uh, claiming, you know, to, to be any kind of figure like that. But the the experience of, I mean, I I I I've I've had experiences with um, taking ayahuasca for for example, and to experience, I I think that has it that experience has influenced. Um, the piece, or, so this element of um, spiritually being able to 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 connect to these other creatures, um, me, and and me also trying to 
bring across that experience, maybe that's where it uh, relates to each other, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, may maybe in that sense. But I feel like the, the, the art of shamanism or the craft of shamanism is something, I don't know if I would uh, be comfortable uh, claiming a place in there. Or, but mm -hmm. Yes, perhaps as an analogy. Yeah. Uh, or as of course, I understand <laughs> that you are not claiming to be that figure because of course, this figure exists in a community, in a ritual setting, yeah. and it, it's some sort of authority also in yeah. medicine. But it, it also correlates with science in a sense, yeah. but not science as we know it in the West, yeah. that you go to the university and institute and have... A, no, but there is science in what yeah. shaman does. Yeah because he knows about the plants in the forest, yeah. you know, to make the ayahuasca tea, you have to put together two species separated in the territory, you have to cook them together. There's a formula, there's botanics, mm -hmm. there's, you know. Yeah, and maybe also in the sense that you sort of, also as an actor, as a body on stage, you, you sort of function as a vessel to bring across this, um, thoughts or these experiences that you're sharing through your body, yeah, I mean, maybe there is a sort of sim things that are like... Or a vessel, yeah, that's, okay. that's a very interesting image, a, a vehicle for the, the cosmos, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have a, two questions. Uh, if you don't want to answer it, feel <laughs> at ease to, to, to refuse, yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, my curiosity as a, a not only audience, but someone who, who has been studying this play and about your stage of consciousness when you go on stage. I was wondering if you, you are sober or if you are under the influence of any substance. Uh, because I think here in the Netherlands it's easier to discuss that because, you know, it's the legalization of this substance mm -hmm. has advanced a lot. So you, you, you're wondering about that. Uh, and to make a confession to you, I think the, the play has such an impact on me because I, I had uh, hashish in my mm. consciousness, I was really... Actually, uh, <laughs> there was more people uh, in the audience that uh, have experienced it when they took something. And I, I, I think I understand. I mean, when I'm performing, I, I don't take uh, those... I, I don't take any substance in that way. But, but I think it's also... You know, we were talking, of course, uh, about different ways to reach a certain kind of um, uh, 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 awareness or a certain kind of mental state. And of course, taking hashis or any, some other um, uh, stuff can stimulate that. Um, and for me, when I am performing, I am also in a way maybe stimulated because I am in this also meditative state that we were talking about. Um, and I, I always think it's really interesting that I've heard this and I didn't check it, but I think it's true like in uh, Germany that you are, as an actor, you are not allowed to drive maybe two hours after the play because you're not in right, you, you're, you're under influence. <laughs> and I have experienced it like driving really soon after a show, you are under influence. You have this all this adrenaline in your blood and, and, and you are a bit, you can maybe feel a bit drunk or a, a bit of like, in another mental state, so I guess through playing I do bring myself in another state, but I, I, I don't take uh, things in advance. Mm, that's very interesting, and I think is, this is my last question, and a, a thing that I thought interesting in the play, you're on stage almost all the time, and you change costumes in plain sight, so I was wondering, how do you deal, like emotionally, because like you're already very exposed, 
and you're changing clothes and changing costumes, does it correlate with the fact that the play is also like about metamorphosis? You go from the fish to the space shuttle to the cell to the dancer and you, you didn't want to conceal the change in your material body so you decide to uh, change your costume on plain sight. Yeah, I, I think uh, we, wanted the, we wanted it to be about um, the fact that I am trying to be all these characters in a way at the same time, in time, but still at the same time. Um, and the comp I mean, we worked with a, a really amazing costume designer, Anne-Rick Strast is her name, and, and the concept we came up with quite soon was that it should be, in the beginning, everything, and then peeling off a layer, layer after layer, to sort of attempt to get to some kind of essence. Um, and yeah, we wanted to show it because it's also really cool to see how everything is on top of each other. Um, and that is also that is also part of the attempt that I'm doing in this in this piece. It is about you. You can see also the attempt. You can also see me changing different things on my vocal computer. Uh, you 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 can see me creating this illusion, and you can see me doing it. It's. I mean, so it's it's about trying to create magic, but not at all hiding that you are trying to create it. Um, so that's also why it was all, it's not like smoke and pff, I'm someone else. You just see me <laughs> doing it and then still hopefully you are willing to believe and continue with me. Um. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, I want to thank you a lot for sharing so much. My appreciation for the Gaia Hypothesis is <laughs> wider than ever. <laughs> And do you have any last remarks that you would like to share? Or do you think perhaps you could do a little bit of the, the text of the play or uh, something that could be a real good ending? Well, no, I don't think I should do text, but I think maybe should, I don't know where this will go, but I think it's just really nice to also um, say it. So we've already talked about Rolf van Oosten that I've worked with, Anderik Trast, the costume designer, um, Thomas van Oosten directed, uh, Thomas Schoots directed the piece, um, and uh, I've also worked uh, very uh, nice with Emke Idema, she was like a conceptual sparing partner. Um, so it's, the, the funny thing about this piece is I am alone, but it's very much like a collaborative piece with all these, uh, well, it, it's a collaborative piece with the whole universe, of course, but because I, I in a way, I didn't make anything up. So I just, you know, uh, looked up everything that was there and, and expressed it. But it's also a, a big collaboration between uh, some great human collaborators. Um, so yeah, the, like the, the, it being a solo, it being about loneliness and it being about uh, a feeling of togetherness, it was also in the core of creating it. So, and, yeah, that's nice. maybe that's a nice thought to edit mm -hmm. it. <laughs> Did you present it only in the Netherlands or in other countries also? I, uh, I presented it as well uh, in London uh, on a, a festival and hopefully there will be future um, performances in other places. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. I love that expression that uh, the Gaia Hypothesis was a collaboration with the whole universe. <laughs> <laughs> That's really amazing. And I think it correlates with the title of the article I tried to write, yeah, yeah, which says does. the cosmos fits inside the theater yeah. in the one yeah. woman cyber opera. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, yeah, and I mean, I, I, uh, when, when I read your article, I was thinking about, you just said like, what, uh, what happened to Lynn Margulis, right? Um, it was a, a good question and, and we... I, there was a point in, in the rehearsals that we were um, sort of feeling that there were too many details in the, in the, in the text 
and sort of narrowing it down to, and then uh, I sort of sacrificed uh, Lynn, but I do feel bad about that. So I feel like I should do like a whole piece on <laughs> on Lynn Margulis, maybe. Um, so I, I I try to uh, make up for uh, for 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 that I did that. Um, and maybe uh, now that that the piece really works, it, there is room to put another uh, to put her name in again. Um, yeah, there's a letter inside the play, dear James Lovelock. I was wondering, well, where's the letter, dear well, Lynn? Actually, you know? there was a song also, dear Lynn. Dear Lynn. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it, the the. Not it didn't have to do with Lynn, but it wasn't good enough for other reasons. <laughs> it had nothing to do with Lynn, but uh, yeah, it mm -hmm. didn't make the didn't make the play. Um, awesome! But, That's an amazing <laughs> invitation for anyone who wants to see the Gaia Hypothesis. It's a collaboration with the whole universe <laughs> inside the theater room. So thanks a lot. It was lovely talking to you. And. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> yeah, thank and you for uh, talking to me. It was mm -hmm. a pleasure. Yes.